Okay. Um, <clears throat> welcome, welcome everybody to the last uh, of the lectures of the series, the difficult double. Um, it's it's truly a pleasure to to present you, Frida Escobedo. She's a very dear friend of mine, I have to say, um, and an amazing architect. I had the pleasure about a year a year ago, exactly, yeah, about a year ago in April last year, to see her beautiful museum for Siqueiros, uh, the Mexican painter, a muralist, in fact, um, uh, in real, real time. And I, I truly think it's one of the best buildings I've seen uh, that year. It's uh, extremely particular. And I would say, in many ways, already a difficult double on its own right. Um, uh, the simple fact of making a building so closely to the actual place where the artist was making his work, it was his studio. So I think the dance made in that particular museum uh, with Siqueiros, um, I truly hope <coughs> we will make tonight with uh, Alvaro Siza. So thank you very much. Um, you're very curious. Thank you. Can you hear me, everyone? Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, when Kirsten first told me that I was invited to this lecture series. I got very nervous because my difficult double was CISA and it's indeed a very difficult double. Um, but then I thought about it more like a psychoanalysis as he was explaining to me later. And that's how I want to approach this lecture. I'm just going to show one project from CISA which actually uh, really marked uh, the way I see architecture or spatial practices and then I'm just going to talk about a few of my own which have their own difficult doubles as well. Uh, it's more like a kind of introspection to the work. So the, the project that I chose from CISA is it's this, is a um, Lesa de Palmeiras Pools near Porto um, as you can see in the picture, uh, when I got there it was not uh, summer season yet and it was closed, so it was not even filled with water. But it still gave me a very, very strong impression between what artificial or man-made architecture and the context could look like together. And that's, that's why I like this picture very much. It's a little bit pixelated because I took it with a small camera from my phone. But this is like the, the real context of the of the swimming pool, this is a shallow pool for children and what surprised me was while I was at this space and it was closed, there was no one really there who was using this, um, these swimming pools. It was a very, very uh, strong um, impression. Um, it seemed to me like the, the building was there for, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't tell really the time where it was built. Uh, this was built in the 60s, way before um, even the, the, how do you say Clavel in, in, in English? The, the Carnation Revolution in, in, in Portugal, right? In, in 74, this was made in 61. So it was a time where still control was over Portugal, but also uh, it didn't have a very strong contextual feeling to the overall Porto um, architecture. It's a very abstract building and I think it relates more to what the context is. But in a way, and this is, this is a nice image in its emptiness, because it's, it's really about um, the layers of, of artificiality that surround this, uh, these rocks and these boulders and this, this water, waterscape. It's not a subtle architecture though, it's a very strong line. We could even talk about like the shadows or the space around it. But what I'm interested in is the way it uh, seems to be happening like in a strata uh, way, like layers of erosion and accumulation happening over this, this landscape. We could, we could stop about and talk about how this was influenced by some of his um, uh, favorite architects. For example, we could say that it was influenced by Thales in West. Uh, but I'm, I'm not, I don't want to go there right now. I, I would like to tell more about... Um, there's another reason why I chose this project, and it's because it was one of his first works. And I think 
during the first works of architecture, it's um, more evident what the influences are. And I feel myself that I'm starting my, my own career. I have a few projects. And I would like to see and start the conversation to, to get to, to know if I have um, this evidence of another influences in my own work. Um, as I was saying, this, this is like the, the melting landscape and the, the building. And it reminded me a lot to uh, another project by Tony Smith, which was not an architecture project. It was actually an artist project. And if you see the pictures, they look quite, quite, quite similar. And it reminded me to, the, to this idea of a ruin and what it can mean to you or to myself. Uh, on one way, uh, Cisse was telling that the ruin is a building that preserves the essential. And on the other hand, uh, Tony, Tony was saying uh, with this project of ruins of the Passaic, monuments of the Passaic, that the ruins is a kind of an invert monument, uh, a timeless place. Um, and that, that idea also stuck in my mind while I was doing my master's degree. And I related it to my own personal experience. This is um, some pictures of Pia Camila, Mexican artist. But this is what you can see in most parts of Mexico City and their highways. So this is what the Folies of Tony, Tony Smith would look like in Mexico. And there are also like ruins in reverse. There are timeless buildings, but at the same time there are unfinished expectations, you know, like um, it's, it's not about something that happened in the past that flourished and then slowly decayed, but more, it talks about more like the future that would never come. These were unfinished buildings actually, and instead of being eroded by time, they actually never met the expectations or the, or the function that they were meant to. This is a, this is a series of, of her pictures. And as you can see, there's a formal resemblance also to Sisa, I think, uh, where these abstract figures, these brutalist uh, elements, and the, the, the heavy materiality almost melts with landscape. And I think it does so in a way of strata. And it also made me think like one of the, the projects that I was doing while I was doing my master's degree in the GSD and that eventually turned into an exhibition in a Mexican gallery called Liga, uh, who, who, who is, which is run by a Mexican studio, Productora. Uh, Kirsten is really good friends with, with Juan AX, one of the, the head directors of, of Productora. Um, and what I wanted to explore in this installation, well, it, it, it started as, um, as an investigation, actually was how these layers can also be composed of, of so, something other than just material, something um, that goes beyond what is artificial and what is nature, and how these layers can also talk about social time and social structures. And that curiosity probably comes from me coming from Mexico City. This is the way we build, you know, this is the, uh, the main temple, the, the main aspect, the, the main Aztec temple in the center of city. And the way it's built, it's, it's rebuilt one on top of each other, this pyramid. Every five years, you build a new pyramid on top of the other. So there is a way of denying the past, but also recognizing it and covering it with a different layer, with a different expectation, with different use. And this also happened during the, the colony from Spain, where you could get like um, Aztec temples where m most of them were uh, covered or um, intervened and turned into Catholic churches, for example. And this way of accretion, um, you can find in any corner. This is the m museum of, of El Museo de la Ciudad de Mexico, the Mexico City Museum. And uh, you can see all the layers of time, but they also do happen um, in a psychological way. It's almost like we believe that there's one face for the other and then one face for ourselves. And we build ourselves like keeping adding layer after layer. This is an image of uh, the god of corn and death, Shipetotec. 
And the myth is, if you can see the, the image, you can see that it has like two mouth openings and it appears to be a mask, but it's a mask within a mask. So every year you get born out, you get a new face, but you recognize the other that's coming through. You know, like the shape that's holding the, your old face is the one that's giving shape to it. I don't know if I'm making a lot of sense here, but um, it's like one layer is denying the other, but at the same time it recognizes it and reveals it by denying it. And I thought this was very interesting because um, I was doing also uh, research on how facades show our personal um, interest, our collective imaginary, our desires, our expectations. And you can see it even in self-made architecture. This is an, a very common example in Mexico City where you can see in one piece of land where it's just one house, you can actually see the three heads of, of the house, which means they have three main incomes at least, because they made the decisions of painting each of the areas one different color. So even though this is, this is a single family, they're, they're making different decisions. You can see the time additions. You can see uh, the preferences, you know, like the, the curved window, uh, the California window. And then on the other side, you can see that there's only one head of family here because there was just one choice on how to spend the money on this, on this house, painting it all green. But you can also see these additions happening over time. You can probably see that this was one first uh, building and then it, it, the, 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 this is another addition, another addition, and then the final one. So, and, and then there are religious aspects to it, you know, and the political aspects to it. So the, the facade really tells how we live and how we want to represent ourselves. And this, it, this was very interesting in, in the way of a term, because facade is facha, the face, but it's also, it comes also from an um, etymological root, which is facere, which is to do. And it's what we do with how, how we represent ourselves. And that, to me, was really, really interesting. And then the question became, like, how do we represent ourselves in a, in a modernist building just like this, which is very strict. It's a very rigid grid. And it seems to be very anonymous. And it doesn't say anything to, to the outsider. It's a, it's a blank face. But then if you get closer to it and you take a a very um, sharp look to it, you start noticing that these additions are not like the ones that they move in Tati. This, this is not an abstract building. This is not a, 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 a mute uh, container. It has a lot of information in it. It's actually, I think this is what I believe is a true intelligent facade. It has a lot of additions, their relationship to transparency, it's quite fascinating. Some, sometimes people have a, a recognition to this transparency and take, uh, take advantage of it, like these lawyers here, which were um, announcing themselves to the streets, or they can even like do religious representations to the outside. This is like a a little strip of archangels hanging in the window, and then some other people completely deny it and see their, their additions here, ignoring the, the facade. It's like they were protected by this anonymous glad facade, and then they could do anything they wanted in the inside. And it becomes like a, a different strata. Revealed, like, if you, if you see it from the side, it's quite, um, it doesn't say anything, but then you slowly start turning into the building and it tells, tells you a lot about like the weather, how it's turning these silver sheets into rust, then the water, the, the additions, the personal preferences, as I was saying, and even like some expectations. For example, this guy wanted to have a French office, but he was trapped in a modernist building and he said, why not? I'm going to have my French, my French office no matter what. And then he decided to do this tiny window and just ignore the whole facade. So the, the project was actually more like trying to decode all these layers. And what I did was photograph each one of them and start to slowly uh, deconstruct all these layers of history and see, for example, once you start photographing these details, you start realizing that this is, for example, um, 
a travel agency and you can actually see what's happening inside though they deny the interior and then on the other side they start recognizing it and you can see like for example these crews uh, I don't know posters and in a way it reminded me of this uh, art piece which is Giuseppe Pannone this, this building to me represented a way of um, a materiality that you can see for example in wood or in marble or in some other kind of stones it, it talks about their own genesis and I think this is very representative because what Benuna was doing here was trying to find what's what's behind all these layers of history what's what's like the, the real root of all these these complex uh, conformations and you can see him carving here the younger tree of, of, the, of out of the tree trunk and it also has to do with sedimentation and how we understand now nowadays what is sedimentation not, not just in terms of ornament but also like in social time and, uh, and how, how spaces are used and how they transform each day it's funny that even Adolf Loss was using this type of material and I think I know why he was fascinated with this type of marble when he was saying that decoration and ornamentation was as a crime but then he, he started using all these uh, the, this materials that also talked about their own genesis and, and, and now I think I can relate to that because I think this can also represent a kind of sedimentation in a different way uh, finally, while well, the exhibition was presented, it's a, it's a very small gallery in a triangular space, so all these windows were uh, put together so they could represent actually this abstract building um, that continues and that happens along most of the um, South American cities. I'm sure that here in Switzerland the, the decay is not as evident, but in Latin American cities you can see these in every corner and I think it talks about um, yeah that the process of um, recognizing um, individuality within anonymity as Martin and her very strict uh, grids if you you cannot see it right here but actually what she was trying to do was representing difference through repetition and I think that's what happen exactly with these modernist buildings. Um, we were not doing actually um, industrial processes for this for this for these buildings. Uh, all the windows were handmade, all all the little details were actually adaptations. So you can see those buildings and uh, above all that the social strata that I was talking to you about. And while I was thinking about this, I decided to show you another project which had to do also with repetition and with the spontaneous. And it's a small city, which is Museum Le um, Museum. And actually what was asked was to do an intervention in a very difficult space. It's a, it's a very famous architect's space. It's a very challenging uh, courtyard. And what I decided that one word that could be repeated in the city is also by Ruders or Ferreira Goulart and uh, all the Brazilian and concrete poets and try to say, try to find a word that would give as much meaning as possible having the less um, syntactic uh, representations which means um, what would be the, the most common word in our suburbs for example in Mexico City I would say it would be the cinder block and I was thinking about uh, what a Mexican young writer also told like um, it's very similar to the work of a bricklayer. It goes from one side to the other and you start building with words slowly. So if you could compare literature to architecture, and I was thinking about new concrete poetry, what would be the single word to use and give different meaning with just one element? And I decided this was it. And it was set in a very rigid grid, as you can see. But then what happened is like all the different configurations would actually be very evident. 
And there were two different configurations. The one given by the museum, which were very specific, it had to become, uh, for example, a forum, it had to become a bar, it had to become like certain very specific things, but also people could move around the pieces and in a way that if you change just one little letter, the whole meaning of the word changes here. It, this is in Spanish, you can actually not see it, but this was kind of the operation that was going through my head. And you can see here a couple of girls playing around. They're, they did their own little city here. This is a specific installation that the museum asked, and this is their own personal configuration. And it's actually the very rigid grid that allows for this to be, become visible. There you can see them playing again, and then enjoying the little fortress. And then it also um, gave, gave ground to other artists to make more specific installations. This is actually Pia Camille again. I promise you she's not a friend of mine. It, it's just a coincidence that she appeared twice. Uh, she did a performance in Eleco. Um, she did this kind of... She, she wanted a, an igloo. Uh, it was technically impossible, so she, she managed to do this kind of magical circus, circle to, to create her own um, performance. And this is the way the museum actually wanted it to, to work. It's like a very formal stage uh, blocks and that. But what I think is important is that one very strict representation can actually make manifest the social use or the, the spontaneous manifestations of, of architecture and, and, spa and the spatial use. And in that sense, I wanted to connect that project to another installation that I did uh, for Lisbon Trinal uh, last year, uh, where I started doing this exercise with Jose Esparza, who was the curator of, of this um, part of the program, which was the new Publix Forum. And he commissioned me um, he wanted a stage, but he didn't want it to be vertical, he didn't want it to be a podium, he didn't want the audience to be on the other side of, of this line, like, like we are right now. So we started to take out all the, all the important words that he wanted to express, and what we came up with was that this stage should be circular because this is a more democratic space, that there's a reason why the round table is round no one is on, on the head of the table. And at the same time, we wanted to create something that would speak more about the listener than the speaker. So the project was um, proposed in a way that it would actually shift with the weight of the listeners to give, it, to give the, the speaker a little bit more of height. So, the voice is visible only when, the, when it's activated by the listeners. So this is a, this, the, the general scheme that we presented. It's a little bit exaggerated here, but um, you can see it here. If, if there's a flat audience, you're equals, and as much people gathers, then your voice actually rises physically and not just phonetically. Um, there was a second aspect to it. We wanted to invert the condition. There was a play by Andres Jaque that was going to be presented. I'm sure you know his work. He's, he's a great Spanish architect. He also works with uh, social dynamics. And he wanted to present uh, a play in the stage. And what we decided to do was to invert the condition of what the forum was and what the stage was. So all the people would come inside and actually see the city from inside the stage, and this curtain would actually reframe the city so you could see uh, the city, as they say, with the eyes of a tourist again, and actually meet, meet again with the little details and start recognizing things that maybe you haven't seen before just by framing it in a different way. And then the play would actually melt with the, with the context and start playing with, with the real uh, players of the city. <coughs> Um, choosing the plaza for this uh, project was another challenge. And it happened in Lisbon, which <laughs> is actually one of Fisa's main uh, playgrounds, if I could say so. Uh, and all the plazas in, 
in Portugal, especially in Lisbon, have this condition of having a monument that's uh, in the center, it's very hierarchical, and then they have a public building most of the time, it's either a public building or um, a religious building or a theater or a church. And then we found out this here, which used to be market, and then it was uh, renovated and torn down and turned into a plaza. And it has a very uh, specific condition. One, it is a transit space actually, it's not a gathering space or it's not a social place, it's just, you just go here to get into the subway or get the, um, the train or a cab. It, no one really stays here except for maybe skaters at night. And that's why we decided to, to take this because there, there was also a different condition with this monument, if you can see it here, this, this monument is not centered in the plaza. It was moved here so this guy could actually see, have a view to, to the river. And it was put in the corner actually denying the civic space that was left. And it's, it's like the, the monument is denying the civic space that's surrounding it. So we decided to make a counterpoint and exactly place the, the civic stage behind this, this equestrian sculpture. This is how it uh, ended up being. It's a 50 meter diameter um, tortilla or Mexican tortilla that landed there. Uh, and you can space. And it was produced in Mexico, which is uh, something that maybe we can talk about later. Uh, it, it was not important. It was, it was more an economical matter than, than anything else. But it was transported and it ended up being there. And actually you can see here the relationship with the, with the audience and the people playing around. We had to fix it and, and we need to also like, I wanted to be completely honest with, you, with, with what happened with the project. And it actually didn't move that time. Uh, people from the Triennale were very nervous about it, like crushing someone or, uh, you know, making a, a huge disaster. So we had to put in a in a fixed position, unfortunately. But at the end, uh, what did work, for example, was this uh, the the theater with Andres Jaques play, and it was really exciting to see actually how people uh, who were passing by really became part of the of the actors or what, what was happening on scene and people laughing when an old lady was walking around here interrupting the play and how she would stop and stare at the audience and actually engage with them and I thought that was really interesting. Um, so what I want to try to say was to use that seemed to be more of an installation instead of an actual architectural uh, building as we understand it in nowadays is that my interest in how this space unfolds and talks about other uh, relationships, social relationships or other ways of behavior with the context. And this is um, one of the images that I like most. This is uh, one of the beaches of Lydia Clark. This, this object that uh, somehow has a certain materiality but it unfolds and transforms the space surrounding it and it's only activated by the, the actor or the hand that moves it. And in that way I wanted to show you this last project so we can move on to the questions because that's the really interesting part. Um, this is the museum that Kirsten was talking about. It's, uh, it used to be um, the weekend house and the atelier for uh, Siqueiros, the, the, the very famous Mexican muralist. And it was quite a contradiction from the start because he, he proclaimed himself to be a communist but he had a swimming pool in a weekend house so it was quite a contradiction. Um, but we were asked to do this competition and when we walked inside, this is, this is a plaza right in front of the, the museum and these murals were working out as a fence towards this public space. Uh, he was actually using them just to um, paint them here and then they moved to different buildings, some of them in Mexico City, some of them um, in many places. Um, and what's interesting is that w once you went inside that courtyard, there were these two beautiful murals which were 
falling apart, uh, but they were not open to the public. And one of the main um, principles of Mexican muralist movement is to make it a public art. So it was to me very obvious that these had to return to a position where they could be seen from the public, um, from the pub public ground, and not have to pay a ticket to get in and see it. So what we decided to do was just rotate their position, actually like just moving them like that. And you can see here in this diagram, these were these murals that we were looking at. It's like we were standing here looking at this, and then we just rotate to them to open them up to the plaza. And then that action actually configured the, the whole rest of the museum because these structures, as you can see, are so big that they could hold a new museum's program, just like the bookshop, the cafeteria, uh, the, the Siqueiros archives, that, that was all the new program that was going to be added to this museum without having to touch or, or just having to touch it very little. So you can see all this, this is a new program in a new structure that holds the murals and the, and the, um, the, the bookshop and the, that stuff. And then we have all this, um, it's like a second wall that gave space to also some corridors, the, the reading room, some of the workshops and the storage spaces that were needed. And then the house was turned into an artistic residence that could be used for producing works of art and then being shown at this main space that you see in a workspace for cicadas, but now is the main exhibition space for the museum. This is uh, once the, the murals were rotated, how they communicate with the plaza. And actually, at the beginning was a little bit of a fight because it was giving up the courtyard to the public because it could be used by everyone, but then it was gaining a plaza by giving up a little bit of space. So I think it was a win-win situation where the museum actually got more public space. It got even like all this space for the exhibition of the main piece of art that it holds, which is these two murals. And at the same time, the plaza is benefited by being activated by this new program like the cafeteria and the, and the bookshop because it, it didn't have any actual life before the museum was renovated. Uh, as you can see, all the program is concealed either behind the murals or uh, in this tiny little like um, sliver of, of program that you can barely see with this um, sloped uh, axis. So actually, it's not like we want to put the the new program up front and actually make it very evident. We want to conceal it in a way, but we want to keep it activating the space. And this was the other facade, the one on the side. And what we also wanted to do was to recognize all these layers of time and history and all these additions that had been happening in the museum. And we decided to do so with this um, concrete lattice that could allow for people to see actually like what was happening a little bit behind it and that it would reveal uh, in a certain way what, what was happening behind it, but also would give it a more uh, institutional uh, a status that was required by the museum people. It was more like giving it a little bit of more dignity and spatial presence. And you can see here the spaces are quite simple. Everything is raw, nothing is... Um, it, it, it doesn't have any complicated details or uh, sophisticated materials. It's just concrete and uh, cinder block and metal structure. But then you can see the difference between the old building because it's the white, the white, uh, everything that's white and plaster is the, the precedent building and then everything that's raw material is just a new addition. You can see it here too. And actually the lattice also gives it a very nice condition in the inside. It, it allows for air to go through. It's, it, this, this museum is located in Cuernavaca, which has great weather. It's actually a very warm, warm place. And that's when, one of the reasons why people move there to, to, to their weekend spots. And the light also comes through in a very 
very nice way. And you can see here, once when the night it comes, you can actually see the program that's happening behind. You can see all the all the perforations and the use. And it reminded me, and I just found out this while I was reading about CIS and trying to see if I could relate in a different way just than the stratification that I was talking about. And he was actually doing something uh, with the Gaiola concept. When, when the Chiado in Lisbon burned out and he was asked for this renovation, this massive renovation, he was talking about just preserving the skin and then putting a new program inside. And I think what I tried to do with La Tallera was quite the opposite. It was trying to create a new envelope for the building and just trying to consolidate all these little programs that happened over time and with the addition. And that was just like a brief <laughs> parenthesis about Sisi again. And this is again um, the public spaces of the, of the museum. This is the cafeteria, here's the mural, and then the main entrance. And you can see it here in the night, like everything um, living together, like the public spaces, the ramp, here's the plaza. You can see the reading, um, the reading room here, which connects to the archives that are up here. So everything articulates, I think, in a very um, simple way. And I just want to finish with this image of Robert Smithson that I, th I think um, makes a nice um, a resume of what I was talking about and uh, in this in this picture he he seems to be uh, working with words just like Brenda Lozano was was telling just like building this it's not an architectural piece but it's a spatial piece in in some way and it talks about how language is created by accretion by erosion by sedimentation and I think if we think about architecture in the same way as language, that would happen too. But it's not about um, just layers of material, but also layers of social time, uh, erosion, transformations, modifications, additions. And I think it, it's, it adds up what I was trying to say. And I think I'm going to close with that one and open up the questions. Thank you. Okay. Prescribes. I think we have to start questions here. Um, I was, I mean, just before you did the presentation, we had a very short uh, conversation about the uh, museum of Siqueiros, as you made it, right, or the, the Atelier Turn Museum, and about the fact that until recently you presented it pretty much, uh, I mean, it has been published quite a lot, and the lace wall was very important there in this publication. And the entrance, but you actually admitted that it wasn't yet finished for pictures at the time pictures were taken, um, was not so often, I mean, represented, right? Mm -hmm. Now, having visited the building myself, uh, I was very fascinated uh, by the buildings which that in a way again now when you showed it you, want you me show to very back? much the space <laughs> yeah you see the, the mm -hmm. buildings themselves like you see them here a little bit um, yeah they're they're not so uh, prominent in, in, in the way you show the building at the same time when you started to talk about uh, Leche de Palmera the pool mm -hmm. of Siza in, in some way um, I mean what fascinated me about the pool and maybe even in relationship to that is Okay, you have a set of spaces, very prominent, so the pools, um, the ambivalence relationship between nature and, and the artifice of, of the building. But also there you have these uh, fundamental interventions like these buildings here, uh, which, I mean, pretty much fit with your story of strata, mm -hmm. um, and are almost more important uh, than any of the visible uh, you know, interventions. I mean, more important <coughs> than the base wall, these buildings which in some strange way, and I think when you visit the building, it's much more prominent than in pictures, but uh, in all their, I would say, unresolvedness to a certain extent, in all their uh, brutality, uh, are simply exposed. So I, I was curious uh, on, on how conscious that was for you. I mean, since 
okay, you, you, do, uh, you guys don't show it. So I'm, I'm, is that conscious that you don't show it in the presentations or is it again the pictures? Mm -hmm. um, I think it has to do a lot with the pictures. Uh, it's, it's hard to photograph them, like I'm going to go back. Uh, you, again, you yeah, don't it's really you don't like the, the the most you can see from it is like this corner maybe, but it's really hard to get into an angle. I I would have to take the pictures myself because even when you try to explain to the photographer what is important, they it's like mm, well this corner is not that nice, you know. Like the, it's they try to move and just focus on the murals and but I mean I I don't care. It's um, Maybe in terms of uh, having these these talks and these uh, conversations, it would be important to to give it a little bit more of importance. But I think it was more this. Yeah. I no, think but I'm asking it because I mean my relationship with Caesar is that at least or it used to be at least extremely ambivalent. I mean today I have to visit quite some of his buildings. Different because you see all the weird messy corners. Uh, the way he is presented often in these big books is, is so smooth and so, uh, I mean, yeah, glossy. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't, I don't think it does a lot of uh, yeah, good to the way you would approach him. And in a strange way, I have with your museum, I have the same. So it's exactly the side colors <coughs> which, which seem to be so fundamental. Mm -hmm. so, so if there is a connection, and of course every connection is to a certain extent forced, but uh, between Caesar, let's say Palmera, and many other Caesars, and, and I don't know, maybe through um, Maurizio Rocha or whatever, I mean, there's this, of course, this other lineage. Um, I exactly find it fascinating, these, and that I connect very much with the other references you give, uh, this strata, this, uh, you know, uh, layering of things, where, in a way, the architecture is not so much about the main spaces as you design them, but it seems to be exactly about these spaces in between, which mediate that what you think you perceive, and, and that's what actually is constructed. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I was I was curious to what extent, also since you showed this exhibition in uh, in, uh, in Liga, mm -hmm. uh, again you, 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 there's this ambiguity about <coughs> the structure of the facade, and it's not just a curtain wall. It's in a way a very you know clumsy curtain wall, right, with, mm -hmm. with all its textures and structures. Mm -hmm. So um, I think deep inside that work of yours seems to be really this fascination with this slightly unresolved technicality of architecture. Is that true? Yes, and I think um, maybe that liminal ground, that in between space is, yes, it's represented here in this uh, opening facade, which is not just the, the gesture, the physical gesture of doing this, but it's also about making something that's permeable mm -hmm. on the foreground, on the, like a basement, and then having these huge murals. So it's that there's a visual relationship to the public, and then it's opening up. And then if you go back to Eleco Museum, I'm going to go all the way back. It's about like the the liminal space is actually the grid, because it's the, the rigidness of it that allows for other interpretations to happen. So that's the liminal ground. And then if you go back to this building that we were talking about, it happens just the same. It's the very strict lines that allow for difference to be visible. And I think that's what happens also in this project by CISA, which I chose and maybe didn't make m myself very, very clear or articulate enough. Uh, but it's, yes, it is about having these very strong lines, very sharp, uh, edges which are not defined by their materiality. The, the, the material is quite brutal, it's, it's quite unresolved, it's just concrete, it's poured, it's mm -hmm. just there, it ages well but it's not perfect. But it's so strong that then everything is just made visible, all the differences happen there. And there's a reason why I chose to put just pictures with no people in it because it was not about what, what happened after with the people, it's just with the space. That's so arid that it only difference comes out. I don't know if I'm answering your question with that, or their relationship yeah, with partly that. Partly, I, I have a feeling that there's this uh, weird uh, dance around the unresolved of the corners, which I see very much in Caesar, and I somehow see very much in these things you don't really show <laughs> of your, your work. I, I don't know. Maybe it's of course, maybe it's imaginary. I'm mm -hmm. not sure, but uh, th there's this. Uh, I think it goes beyond the grid. Okay, the grid. I mean, it's there, the organization is there, 
but also the Leche de Palmera pool for me is not necessarily a project which is, I mean, appeals to me because it's clarity. In mm -hmm. a way, for me, it's very interesting because it's so extremely unclear mm -hmm. and it's decisively so. And uh, the, the, uh, the Keres Museum of yours, or, or the, the, yeah, the, the former atelier, uh, that's what I was saying. I mean, the lace facade is extremely clear and simple, and then you have front and the back and the layering, yes, but, but it's this strange front, which looks also a little bit like a back, with all this weird machinery, which in an odd way makes me think of constructivism. Uh, you know, this uh, strange uh, kind of uh, gigantic panels which seem to engage in this discourse of these uh, murals pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the communication, but then again, the front and the back, and all this machinery you need to have them tilted in a certain way. And I find that unresolved again mm -hmm. uh, far more fascinating than, than the smooth spaces it gives. Mm. But I don't know, maybe. I mean, I, I do see a lot of this coming back. I mean, the strata, the catastrata, you see the complexity of the earth. I mean, th there seems to be a very bizarre fascination. Is there because it's unavoidably so? Mm -hmm. The decision to put these two gigantic. smooth in that sense. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has frays. It, it, it can start <coughs> fraying or it can stop there. You never know. You have to wait to see and that's why I like about it. Mm -hmm. So, people from the public. Yes. So I can ask yeah, please, yes, please. Um, so, uh, so, you were given the task to, to, to make this talk about CISA. Uh, and the, the reference you, you show and the images you show seem to come, well, they come from somewhere else. There are uh, different artists and poets. And, uh, would, you, would, you, would you have shown some, someone else? Or is it, have you, like, Preparing this, book, found out something maybe about your own, mm -hmm. the, about this. Yes. Um, uh, what are your important things to you? Yes, I think it turned out to be more like a psychoanalysis, as I was saying earlier. If you you start, you start trying to see what your influence is. Because this, of course, CISA, well, not for everyone, but at least for me, was, was an important <coughs> architect while I was doing my, my undergrad course. Um, but then it started out like, okay, what's really important in this project? And it, it didn't have to do with materialness. It, it had to do more with whatever I was looking at the time. And then I was realizing while I was reading about CISA that he was mentioning it himself. Like, well, while you're at undergrad school, there's a very formal influence you know, like very direct from the people or the architects you admire and then slowly it starts to melt with other things and starts to turn into more of a blur. It's more difficult to say what the direct influences are. It's just what, what you were living and doing at the time. And that's why I try to clarify. So it's not just about CISA, of course. It's about what, whatever it was on my, the back of my head at, at that moment. And th the funny thing is, like, it was a coincidence, but while, while I was here at CISA's pools, I was told about the competition in, of La Tallera Siqueiros. It was, it was something, a bit of a funny coincidence. I was there, and then they, told, they called me and said, like, okay, you, you won the competition, you have to come back to Mexico to build it. So, I don't know. Good luck with CISA. Uh -huh.
But again, I find, I find this picture of the pool interesting to the extent that you have the rocks, mm -hmm. which are then partly painted, right? And so they become, or treated in some way, so they become a pool. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have the other elements of architecture. And in some bizarre way, the, I mean, because of course many buildings, also painters, do not so directly engage in the paintings themselves. So. So the decision to keep the paintings, use the paintings, and then to have them hovering somewhere, for me, has a lot of resemblance to the way Caesar decides to keep the rocks and make a pool. So, so there is an architecture which is there, but which is in many ways, uh, it never really, how to say, it, it doesn't necessarily try to dominate the scene. So, so there's a, a strange, um, how to say, um, uh, was it restrained or something? Um, and and that's that's again that's what for me in that that, that museum is, is peculiar. And then you see the back, and the back I don't know it has many references, but you didn't see the back much here in this uh, slideshow. Mm -hmm. But uh, there seems even kind of Alejandro La Sota reference in some strange way. I don't know if that's true. Mm -hmm. but, um, no, really you know, there's but there's this. Uh, embrace of an extremely technological solution to architecture. Mm -hmm. so, so I was maybe wondering about that. I mean, to what extent um, is this very technical uh, uh, beam, column, infill, idea of architecture important for you? It was m more about what could be... Uh, it, it was not a technical solution trying to be a very sophisticated one. It was trying to be as simple as possible because in public buildings in Mexico you have very little control on who is going to take charge of the, the construction, who is going to be the construction manager. So we tried to do as little details as possible. It was about doing it in a way that could be built fast because that's an important thing. It, it had to be built fast and it had to be easy and it didn't have to have details that it could have details, but the, uh, the, the quality of the space couldn't depend on the details. If the details were not there or were poorly executed, it didn't have to matter. So we had to strip down the building to its very basic stuff mm -hmm. to ensure that the quality of the space didn't depend on something like that. Uh, and in that sense, it's very raw. And some, sometimes we came to the construction site and it was like, this was not supposed to be here, and we were making like a huge fuss about it and then we realized like okay th this is why we planned this building to be very open-ended and very raw in a sense because we don't want to fight over this we we want to we want to have the big fights we want to have the murals moved we want to have you know like these kind of things but not the tiny details it, it doesn't make the building and and it's very like a machine in a way it, it doesn't matter if it's i mean some people say that a, a, a good machine is a nice machine, you know, like everything seems to be working and then everything seems to be perfect, but it's not about how polished it is. And is that, if you compare it with the work you're currently doing, is that a, a track you're pursuing or, for example, more money would make you make very different decisions in terms of uh, rawness? I mean, because it, it can appear as an aesthetic, I mean, mm -hmm. not in a negative way, man, but of course, as, as you explain it, it seems also very much uh, a result of a condition, right? Mm -hmm. so, so is that, of course, in Mexico often the condition is like that? Um, does that mean that other buildings you're doing now are similar in their approach towards it? It's funny because people now are asking me to design buildings that appear to be raw even though they have more money. Mm -hmm. And I find that very... It's, it's very complex because you have to say no. You have to say like, okay, if you want to do like um, a little bit more of a fancy uh, housing complex, you cannot use the same materials because then it becomes a facade in a way, but not in the way that I was talking about this, this previous modernist building. It, it turns into um, scenography. It's, it's not real. It's not the, the real strategy. So we try to navigate uh, the, the client's desire and try to figure out a different uh, solution but it's funny how it can quickly turn to be your signature or mm -hmm. it, it, it can be assumed to be a style and not a strategy and I think that's very dangerous and I, we, we try to stay away from it as much <coughs> as we can.
Yeah, maybe I can ask. Uh, I, was, I was curious when you were mentioning this, uh, you were showing the, the detail from the Mexico Museum and uh, the way, again, with this stratification. And uh, you said that it's a kind of, uh, um, in, a, in a way, denial of what was there before because they just uh, build over it, but in a way also respect because they didn't demolish it or destroy it, but kept it. And um, again, to, to just, uh, well, to, to, to continue with this, also the CESA project, also the project of the show, where, where you also had this kind of uh, existing, existing situation. So it seems that uh, inevitably the detail you are dealing with is this clash, always the duality. Um, I mean, uh, Again, it's also part of this clumsiness, but uh, how important is this for you to preserve and to show um, those gaps and those, uh, again, I mean, I was also curious why we don't see the, the, the for example, the building that you did, but also it's, it's kind of always, uh, even, okay, I didn't see the building, but I could, even from the images, I can imagine something happening in between Mm -hmm. But in a way, uh, I have a feeling also that uh, by um, exposing it too much, then that you kind of lose the mystery about it. Mm. So I'm just curious, like how, you know, the, the, how 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 do you try to preserve? How much do you try to preserve the duality? It's important. You mean like how much I try to to, sh to show the existing existence of the other? Because in uh -huh. this context, it's, the context is just not just the city, it's always building up onto something else. Yes, well that's, that's the condition of being an architect, I guess. You, you always build on top of something else, you know? Whether it, even if it's just a blank space, like a plaza could appear to be like you have nothing and then you have to come up with something. It, that layer turns out to be uh, the, the use, for example, or different relationships. But um, maybe on terms of what you were saying about having it hidden in a way, maybe that's what I was talking about when I was uh, explaining about Mexican masks. The, there's this kind of, um, this phrase or this saying that says, it's like Mexican modesty, you know, like you don't want to show everything, but by hiding you, you try to reveal something. So maybe that's, um, what you were asking, like you cannot, you can actually not show a whole building in pictures. It would be very, um, it's very difficult. And actually, when when you think you're seeing, for example, I'm going to go back to that picture of the front facade or the back facade, as Kirsten, I, I like that you name it the back facade. <laughs> um, sorry, it's, okay, it's coming. But even if you see this picture from here. This is not real. This is not what your eye really sees. This is a this is a distorted image from a camera. So actually, what what you could get more of a closer look would be this. But once you're there, it's just like the huge mural is just coming to you, and then a fraction or a fragment of uh, an interior space like this, or maybe just a tiny little thing like this. So it's more about fragments than trying to actually represent it. So. I don't know, maybe the, the option would be to do a different series of, of pictures to try to explain it, but then I, I don't think that's really important. I think what's really important is the relationship between um, the new edition and the, um, the social aspect to it, how it changed the, the context in that way or in that sense. I don't know. I don't know if, the, if, it, if even the floor plans make it more clear. That would be another question of how, how we represent architecture and how we, we explain it. And it's fascinating to me that, for example, in your studio, and maybe I'm, I'm just going to throw a uh, question back to you, like how do you choose to represent a building? How do you make the decision of making always the, the bottom flat or using sharp colors? Or like, mm -hmm. does that explain something about the building or? We should ask <laughs> uh, well, no, I think we can answer from our side. Uh, I, I think we, that we, we talked about it often before, we truly believe that um, an, a pers an image, a perspective, or a photograph is constructed. So 
you if you make a queue, you have to make a decision on every element of the perspective in order to you know define your narrative. I mean, mm-hmm. it's funny because the whole afternoon we've been busy with that conversation also with the students. Um, to the extent, of course, and we, we had also a lecture in the series of, of Bas Prinzen, right, the photographer, um, and he also talked a little bit about how he, you know, defined his idea of photography and through Giri, for example, and, and others, but I mean, he was somehow married with Giri uh, mm-hmm. in this context. And uh, it, it's about economy of means in many ways. And I mean, it's funny because maybe I'll throw it back to you, this notion of economy of means, because I feel it's important to your work as well. Um, it's, you know that there's very limited uh, you know, products you can make. So these products, uh, I mean, of course, in our case, there's an economy of means, I think, from the perspective of a teacher. In order to be able to compare projects, you give everybody the same set of rules so that you can actually look to the actual building and not to the funny differences in representation. And of course, you know that somebody who's extremely smart will always push his mm-hmm. or her, I mean, presentation just over that limit. So. You know, you could argue, you know, you can only see if somebody trespassing a line if you have drawn a line, that's it. So I think that, that I think, is, is, is how we, we approach it. But the economy of means, both, I think, in our work, but also in, the, in the teaching, in the way we collaborate, the way we collaborate with the students, even in these, these lectures, uh, I think is fundamental. And, and then I go back uh, and I see the project you show, uh, and that economy, seems extremely apparent and not so much because everything is cheap but it's let's say every piece whether it's the kind of untreated steel or is it painted i don't know exactly uh, or or, or the, the 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 kind of uh, concrete lace piece or or uh, for example the one brick and the leco uh, and the, the, the varagan uh, mm-hmm. um is it varagan matthias garitz yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's garitz actually it's his own mm-hmm. yeah. the, the garitz uh, kind of uh, house and Mm-hmm. Atelier. Um, I mean, you see that it's 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 making a very precise choice, and then at a certain point, uh, kind of taking the consequence of that choice. I don't know. I mean, on the one hand, I see I see a set of works which is very widespread. I mean, I mean the, the the almost field-like operation of of uh, of the brick <coughs> and the multiplication of the brick, I think, is quite far away of, from from what we would be doing. I mean. I, I would be, I mean, I, I would feel very, how would I say, um, I would have no clue what to decide on where, where to put the brick. There's too many possibilities. Uh? <laughs> uh, and even though you make a connection, I feel that, in, for example, in, in, in this specific uh, building, uh, a lot of decisions are made, uh, are made through, in a way, the first decision. In a way, and then I, I connect that much more again to, to the Caesar esque if you can simplify his work to that point. Huh? But, uh, engagement with, I would say, um, uh, what is it, coincidence to a certain extent. You know, like uh, you have this, this set of rocks, you can of course pretend you're not there, but the moment you accept, accept that, uh, half of your project is done. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and that I think is very peculiar about Caesar. I mean, there's plenty of other things you could say about Caesar. Mm-hmm. But, but that is coming back here. And then, not denying, okay, you could say I simplify, but I see this set of crazy structures here in between hanging. And, I mean, they're simple, but they're not uh, minimalistic. I mean, they have a certain complexity, which maybe are, I don't know, uh, because of, I mean, technical reasons. But there's not a moment when you say, well, let's do it differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I find, it, I think, if that's I mean, oblique complexity, um, which I see coming back. But then again, uh, you know, it's like the way you project your own interpretation on Caesar. Maybe in the end, we are projecting interpretation on your own on your own work. I don't mm-hmm. know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, and I've talked too much. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you guys ask something? Come on, a good question of Google. Yes, he's really been thinking about <laughs> questions for much time. Today. Please. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe to, to come back on the, the building of Caesar you showed us, because somehow it's funny because <coughs> I don't know so much Caesar, 
but what I remember of him is more of this white faced facade, mm -hmm. very uh, abstract. And somehow you, you maybe show, show me the, the only project of Caesar which is really somehow very brutalist, very uh, mm -hmm. materialistic. And it's funny to see the, the, the frozen water just very wide beneath it because it's, it's exactly the Caesar I know referred to. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. No, I think it's yes, it's right on the point because I was trying to to see at that particular building because of that. It's not like the super polished, uh, very organized uh, CISA building. It's it's not his typical work, and it was one of his first. It was his second actually. So um, maybe he was influenced by something else. Maybe he didn't. He hadn't come up with an identity as an architect yet. And I think that's what's fascinating. This 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 period of an architect's uh, practice where you are still not completely defined. And I think you should keep slippery and you know, uh, you shouldn't be um, enclosed into a particular a specific aesthetic. And that's what I like about this first work. It, it somehow appears in some other projects like the housing project that has this very big concrete wall and but it's very raw in a sense that it's it's, it's almost, um, it's not too brave, it's almost like naive, it's, it, 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 it doesn't feel any danger, it, it can risk everything, you know, like, and then he has to be like this white, very pure prism, all these corners, the light, everything has to be the same, it has to be CISA. And at this point he was just taking risks and doing a great job, I mean, just making that little line on the rocks, like the, that w little sliver of paint, changed the whole context. Even if the building was not there, that was a whole inst installation in itself, I think. It's just like, just marking round and marking a territory. And I think it was very good. No pay too. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay. I think that we should should leave us here with this great hoo ho remark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you.